Today I'm going to go ahead and jump into discussing about dismantling health inequities um, with recovery science. And um, I want to actually just take a minute and um, at the beginning, and I think it's worth just talking about the recovery piece in this instance. You know, I noticed for, for this conference, you know, recovery's in the title. You know, it wasn't research to remission, research to relapse or disorder, but actually research to recovery. So I think it's worth having a conversation about some distinguishing pieces around that. Before I'll go ahead and then I'll talk about a little bit about racial literacy. This is something that I do with all of my audiences because often when you attend a, uh, a talk on health inequities, they jump into that, but we need to have a clear understanding about what race is, what race is not, and some of the very serious consequences that have come from misunderstandings, misapplications, and even scientific abuses uh, that have occurred because of this. Now, uh, going ahead and jumping in, um, when it comes to recovery, I want to hit on a couple different points here, the most common one being that we think of in terms of an individual level. I'll talk about its utility in building an effective public health infrastructure, as well as its bridge to then the recovery support services that can fall under this paradigm. You know, um, historically, when we are looking for outcomes and way to document our work and to capture what's happening in people's lives following a substance use disorder, um, we've relied on some stuff from the medical uh, profession. We look at remission, absence of symp symptomology for one year, full sustained remission. Um, we've also certainly used substance use outcomes plenty in terms of abstinence um, or looking at reductions in use. But the common thread that I say that these kind of have is they're the absence of something type of outcomes, the absence of pathology. But the fact of the matter is, is that um, in particular, people with lived experience will, will tell you that the experience of recovery is something about more than just the absence of something. There is the presence of something, the presence of uh, health. Uh, the presence of well-being, the, the presence of assets and resources that can be used to initiate and sustain recovery. Um, and this has started to influence our orientation, and you'll see this as part of this paradigm shift that's emerged in the field. We, uh, in the idea of talking about remission versus recovery, taking stock of risk factors versus are we taking stock of any protective factors, talking about what's broken with somebody, but let's take stock of what is functioning and maximize that as well. The idea of being powerless versus empowerment or powerful starts to guide our orientation. In fact, when we think about individual level outcomes and when thinking about recovery, you know, at the Recovery Research Institute, we have a number of ways that we go about trying to capture recovery using strength-based assessments in addition to many other in a battery of assessments, quality of life, the perception of, a, of your position relative to your goals and expectations, recovery capital. This is the theoretical idea of the sum total resources needed for recovery across several domains, considering one's self-esteem and their confidence in their worth or abilities and even their happiness in terms of what they're experiencing in their recovery. Now, those metrics are things that we've rolled out into something we call the National Recovery Study. Um, this was representative of the general population of people who uh, resolved a problem with alcohol and other drugs. And you can see that in doing so, we've captured people who have many years of experience um, after resolving a problem with alcohol or drugs. You'll see here we've got zero through 40. And uh, when we did this study a number of years ago, you also see how these a number of these strength-based indicators, quality of life, happiness, capital, self-esteem, you can see the way that it actually starts to graph the trajectories of recovery, and it goes up over time. This is, this is good news, right? Recovery is real. Psychological distress, starting higher, earlier, uh, in the time since resolving a problem with alcohol or other drugs, but going down. Um, now, we also learn from doing the National Recovery Study that it takes about 15 years since resolving a problem with alcohol or other drugs for quality of life to return to the same level in the general population who does not uh, in recovery from alcohol or other drugs. But I want to take a closer look as to what happens in that first year 
or two period that we learned about from doing this national recovery survey. What we learned here is that, you know what, it can get harder for them by about year one than it does on the very first day. It can be harder for them at that point. You can see that by the dip in some of the metrics here. You know, why, why is that? Um, you know, I think that that's when all expertise comes to play, right? Why is in, in speculating as to why that could be? Is it, you know, that they've had time for the fog to clear? You can see more clearly behind you, in front of you, and in terms of the hard work that needs to be done, sometimes the damage that needs to be done, and maybe have a more realistic assessment of what's going on in that time period. But you know, that's really for anybody's interpretation. But knowing these things can help us. They can help us prepare people. We can plan. We can ramp up services when we start to have an indication of when and where that timing should fall. Another thing we've noticed in this data set is this incredible inflection point that happens around five years, long-term recovery, significant differences that we've also captured in this data set has been captured in other people's work as well. This tells us this is an important point that we need to be studying more often. It's difficult when, when our follow-ups are often very short, right? Uh, follow-ups cost time, they cost money. We're excited about six months follow-ups, much less five years, but we need to be understanding long-term recovery and this point about five years or so. Um, and uh, you know, I think that there are some folks in treatment that, are, that arrived at that conclusion as well a number of years ago from, from their data, this important point about five years, an inflection point around there. We're certainly gonna get into this a lot more today, but if you go ahead and just take a look and quality of life and happiness and you stratify it by racial and ethnic groups, the one thing that we saw in this data set that is of notice is that the individuals who really endorse being of mixed race or Native American look at the yellow line significantly different in quality of life. Same goes for happiness, psychological distress higher. And so there are different trajectories that we're able to mark for people, which is helpful in trying to provide service planning and understanding structural, structural factors that could also be influencing these. Now, I find that recovery is an incredibly useful um, organizing paradigm as well. You know, we know that the cost of substance use disorders annually is over $600 billion, mostly due to lost productivity, but as well due to crime and healthcare expenditures. Now, that means that the paradigm we use, that we operationalize to build an effective public health infrastructure must comprehensively address all components associated with this price tag. And that is why recovery as an organizing paradigm um, is incredibly useful in capturing the synergistic role that medical and non-medical factors play in creating global health from global health from substance use disorders. Under that organizing paradigm as well, and you've created yourself a bridge for recovery support services. And um, I just wanna start by showing you something that I took from my, coll my colleague, Brandon Bergman. Um, a lot of the times the question comes up. People um, ask me, I would like to have a recovery community center in my area, but they're telling me there's already treatment, there's no need for it, right? So what is the logic? Well, you can see that um, these services differ both in their goal, time frame, location, and even who is providing the service, you know? And so when asked about, but we have treatment, why would we need, how do we justify it? How do we need, you know, I explained, you know, treatment is incredibly useful. At, um, addressing pathology, symptomology, and of course, substance use. But one of the goals that we'll talk about later here and the function and focus um, that recovery support services bring is to build assets and resources needed to initiate and sustain recovery. Now these recovery support services, um, the ones that you'll see here, they're actually listed in the US Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs, and health. Um, the peer-based recovery support services, these are like recovery coaches and recovery support specialists. They can be used across a number of settings, 
like hospitals, um, where they serve as patient navigators. They can facilitate transitions between level of care, like inpatient to outpatient, um, or provide transportation to a mutual help organization alongside a patient in ways that are not possible for conventional treatment providers. You know, um, trained peers can work out of recovery community centers. They do. Um, they can help navigate services that are not part of an organized system, but rather spread across a community, and they create warm handoffs. And, uh, you know, peers, like the recovery coaches, uh, empirically, I could tell you, so what, what, what's been found, though? Do, are they helpful in any service? You know, we know this to varying levels um, about these services. Um, peer services, um, they've been found to reduce substance use, improve relapse rates, improve relationships with treatment providers, social support, Increased treatment retention is a repeated finding with them, and as well as there have uh, been found to increase greater treatment satisfaction. Now, recovery residencies, um, recovery housing, also sometimes called sober homes, these are um, sober, safe, healthy living environments that promote recovery, and residents um, are expected to abstain from substance use. Um, often, depending on what level you're at, residents pay their own rent, they engage in shared decision making, facility management, financial self-sufficiency, they can engage in informal case management for each other, give advice on how to access health care, employment, um, manage legal difficulties. In fact, it's the National Alliance of Recovery Residencies has emerged from the industry um, and offered standards that address quality control through a certification process that can be adopted by state, so they've become more formalized and intentional um, in their language and approaches. This has a, but what does the science say? Uh, in the case of recovery residencies, this is a strong body of scientific research. Um, this is uh, going to show reductions in substance use, criminality, improved employment, improved income, and the cost effectiveness is there for them as well. Um, I have a, a point at the end where I'm gonna go into a little more detail about that particular service. Recovery community centers, these are an emerging third tier on the continuum of care. Um, recovery community centers, these are a locatable resource in the community that provides a safe place to convene. Some provide access to technology, resume building, recovery coaches, peer meetings, called uh, Building Recovery Capital is one that I've heard about. Um, you know, and some of our preliminary data analysis has shown that, in, that recovery community centers may actually accelerate gains in quality of life within the first five years of recovery compared to the general population in recovery. And so those are some of the things that we're starting to uncover about um, their utility. Recovery supports in educational settings exist, recovery high schools, collegiate recovery programs. You have to hear Noel Vest talk about this, this later. This is his area. Um, in this case, there was, um, there was one rigorous study of students who attended a recovery high school after treatment, and they found that the abstinence rates were twice as high. The graduation rates were about 25 percentage points higher compared to a matched group who went to a non-recovery high school following treatment. So we have some evidence um, that's starting to emerge there. You know, mutual help organizations, those 12-step um, meetings and meetings that are non-12-step, those are certainly the most popular. Um, uh, you know, John Kelly um, wrote a, a systematic review and found that clinically delivered and facilitated um, Alcoholics Anonymous leads to higher abstinence rates of continuous abstinence when compared to other frontline treatments such as cognitive behavior therapy. So that uh, outcome of continuous abstinence is a place where these are unmatched. Now, in terms of, you know, how, but how do they fit into a medical model um, is a question depending on your background and, and, and what you're working with here. Well, you know, historically, We've treated substance use disorders with a very epistotic approach. Medical detox, clinical stabilization, some type of brief episodic treatment, but eventually we started to treat substance use disorders like a treatable yet chronic and persistent disorder, which calls for this continuing care paradigm or a recovery management approach. Now, the function of recovery support services, one of them, 
uh, can be to build recovery capital. And some of them specialize this even, then even more than others. Like those recovery community centers are kind of like the Walmarts of recovery. They're quite impressive. Um, you know, but the idea of recovery capital, these are your collections of resources um, and needed to initiate and sustain recovery. They, you can think about this as being everywhere. We can harness this in terms of our public policy within the landscape of our communities and, of course, our relationships and all the way down to our individual aspects about our experiences and our motivations. All of these represent the layers that we try to harness, utilize, and utilize. You can, another way of thinking about recovery capital, um, you know, my boss uses this analogy. These are, this is the part where you uh, issue the building materials uh, for reconstruction. Recovery capital, it's an important piece of, of recovery. You know, the assets represent the resources here, and once the building's constructed, it can be put to good use. You know, in addition, Recovery capital helps to mitigate the high burden of biological and psychological stress that's associated with adaptation to abstinence and remission. So it can help can mitigate that transition in that process. Now, for those of you who are here looking for information on adolescence, you know, I, when it comes to the field of recovery capital, I have to refer you to my colleague at the Recovery Research Re Institute, Emily Hennessy. Um, is uh, one of the few, one of the few working in this area and working to figure out, but what does that look like, you know, for adolescents? Because we know this can be different than it can for adults. And so there are a few people working in this area um, trying to forward our understanding about what are the layers for adolescents, which one has the most variance, which lever should we be pulling. Let's go ahead and um, start with the racial just racial literacy. You have to know how we got here um, to start. Um, about 20 years ago, there was a landmark report from the Institute of Mes Medicine commissioned by Congress that found um, striking disparities in the burden of illness experienced by black Americans. Well, our field is no exception. Uh, black Americans in particular suffer a disproportionate burden of health and social consequences, despite often having either significantly lower or equivalent prevalence of substance use and substance use disorders. Um, now, in particular, you'll see these trajectories play out, um, you know, in, um, in adolescence is actually where you're going to find uh, significant racial differences in levels of substance use and onset of disorder that often follow along racial lines. Um, African Americans often are are lower. Um, cannabis is an exception at this point. Um, 15, 20 years ago, that was a little different. Now, it's not. Um, for African American and African American communities, we also see what we see, what we call um, a crossover effect. Okay, and so these, on average, lower levels of substance use um, and disorder around the age of 35, that trend tends to disappear. Okay, it's known as the crossover effect, um, and. Now I can tell you that some from even the more recent literature, um, from people like Tamika Zapolsky, who have worked on the crossover effect, we're actually learning now that that effect was actually primarily driven by African Americans who had um, low incomes, really meaning uh, $10,000 a year or less. And so when you stratify it by income, we're becoming more precise and understanding that effect that we watched for years, but really what it's being driven by and, 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 and who's really carrying the burden in that. Now, racial health inequities exist why? Disproportionate exposure to risk and protective factors. I put homelessness up there because you know, despite the fact that African Americans make up about 13 to 14 percent of this population, they represent 40 percent of this country's um, homeless population or individuals who are unhoused. Um, when it comes to income, uh, our economists are telling us right now that in this country, uh, white families with, with children, for every one dollar they have, African American families have one cent on every dollar. Um, it is these types of risk and protective factors that are sending the trajectories that you, that you see. Um, race was derived as a social construct. 
Okay, so this is what you're looking at when you're seeing it utilized in science and even rolled out into medicine. Um, it is not a proxy for ancestry, biology, genetics, or class. We used to use it as a proxy for class. We've gotten better at that. Um, ancestry is a different construct altogether. Okay, and ancestry does matter in terms of addiction, but that's not what race is. Okay, so you should interpret race effects in the, more akin to a caste system. So, some examples of why it matters. <laughs> what has happened? This is an example of when our use of the race variable in science um, exceeds our racial literacy and its applications um, start to be, uh, mi there are misapplications of it. You know, we don't, we don't have clear guidelines on how to use, sci on the, on how to use scientific results on race um, and how they should be implemented in medicine. For example, despite the evidence that race is not a proxy for genetic differences, the belief that it is has become embedded into medical practice. Uh, one insertion of race into medicine involves diagnostic algorithms, as outlined in this, incredible, in this incredible piece in the New England Journal of Medicine, and practice guidelines that adjust or correct their outputs on the basis of a patient's race or ethnicity. So physicians use these algorithms to individualize risk assessment and guide clinical decision making and by embedding race into basic data and decisions in healthcare, these algorithms propagate race-based medicine. Many of the adjustments um, that these of these, for these algorithms guide decisions in ways that may direct more attention and resources to patients who identify as white as opposed to non-white. Um, this was an incredible piece that came out that highlighted these instances and uh, all across uh, medicine. Um, at the same time, the federal government started to inquire into all of these governing bodies. For example, lots of times a, a f field may have a governing body that they defer to, asking them, what are you doing with this race variable in your assessments? Um, they had so much time to respond. It's an interesting story. You should look it up. Um, some of them uh, gave a justification um, that was weak. Other times, some people e uh, even wrote back and said, at this point, we don't know. We will have to look into it and tell you, okay? So um, that's one example, but this is another one. So you can see, the, it's kind of a rip from the headlines here. Black former NFL players say racial bias skews concussion payouts, and the NFL will stop assuming racial bias differences. What we have here are um, the utilization, the misinterpretation and misapplication of race-based findings and science that are later used and exploited for financial gain. So as somebody with a background in psychology, I also identify as a test theorist. So I develop assessments and I'm a racial expert. So what happens is when we, I, when we sometimes uh, develop assessments or use assessments, um, there was a finding in the literature repeatedly found that African Americans have lower scores on IQ than other people and a few other types of assessments that fall along that line. So what did they do with this finding? Used it as a justification for smaller payments built into their algorithms, a justification for smaller payments to black players following concussion injury. Why? Because if you're dumber to start with, we don't owe you as much money. We didn't do as much damage. So that went on for years. This is what the status quo does. This is an example. This is an example of how we have, all of us, have inherited a society that is set, was set up on white supremacy. That's a scary word. It was here before we were, but we have to actively dismantle it. This didn't stop until George Floyd was murdered. It takes something like that to break the status quo. 60 to 70% of their players are black. This doesn't need to be perpetuated or go on, but this is why I'm going to wrap up my lesson on racial literacy because, as I said, when the literacy, when our use of race exceeds our literacy and what to do with it, you can propagate health disparities um, and even, uh, even facilitate financial exploitations based upon assessments that people like me and studies that people like me did. So there are a few analytical implications 
So for those of us who are scientists in training here, doing some research, um, or, or maybe you are, you're already on the faculty and you're doing these things, um, so what's the analytical implications about using race in science? So there are no causes of race. This is incredibly important for scientists. We all want to, want to know what the cause is. But when we're looking through our databases, we don't have another variable that caused that one, okay? And so what that means is that technically there are no confounders of race. So when we hear the expression, oh, but it was confounded with, so we actually don't know what happened. No, 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 no. So a confounding variable is selected because it potentially causes your independent and your dependent variable at the same time. It doesn't meet the definition for having confounders. That's not an appropriate interpretation of what you're looking at here. Another way of saying it, is that your racial identity can indeed affect your health status. But having an opioid use disorder isn't gonna make you black. There is a temporal arrangement that has to be honored and you will see it violated sometimes in studies and interpretations. So race can affect your class status, but being poor isn't going to make you Latino. So these are things that we need to understand and consider when we're using our variables in our models. So in other words, these gross associations that we start with at the beginning, if you are working in health intervention and you see that race is predicting an outcome, that association is real that you're looking at. So um, for my researchers in the audience who may be considering working in what I call health equity, science and you want to explain these things, your abstract should include the gross association between race and your health outcome. That race coefficient represents your health disparity. You are to note in the abstract if with every variable you entered, did it increase or did it decrease the disparity? You are looking for mechanisms of health disparities, okay? And furthermore, when you go to write your abstract, you'll suddenly realize there's no statistical test to show you what happens between model to model. Usually, there's not. You will have to use your eyes and your own judgment, and you'll have to calculate it and report it. Health equity intervention should evaluate the degree to which pre-existing health inequities um, at baseline were eliminated post-intervention. This is analysis of the gap. This is different than we have when we have an intervention and we look at main effects uh, helping both groups, but an analysis of the gap is, is, should be the focus of health equity intervention science. And that idea is not even new to community psychology. Community psychology has been dealing with the gap between groups uh, for years, actually. So we can take, it, take that idea from them, honestly. So now that we talked about our, our lesson in terms of racial literacy, let's go ahead and um, through a lens of racial literacy, we'll look at what we know about course of illness, um, remission, and recovery. Just looking, first of all, um, you know, across everybody, across everybody, we, under, we have an understanding that, um, you know, recovery and remission can take a considerable amount of time. Um, individuals in remission are susceptible to relapse for many years even after achieving, achieving a full sustained remission. Specifically, we know it takes about five years of continuous sobriety before the risk of relapse um, drops below 15% in the following year, which is when, we mentioned 15% because that's when you're no more likely than somebody in the general population to have a substance use disorder. And it takes that long for the risk um, to fall. And so, uh, but these windows, understanding these windows of opportunity, this is too long. They can be shortened. That's why we want to know this information. But I get that slide that I just showed you from the Recovery Research Institute, but um, it also inspired me to put together and organize the field of literature and the way we understand it for African Americans in a similar timeline. So black individuals progress on average. Black individuals progress from the initiation of use to the onset of the disorder faster. This is an effect in the literature referred to as telescoping. It's been documented several times. Individuals that identify as black on average have a later age of onset for substance use disorders in their mid-20s to others who onset in their late teens. Um, Kira Alvarez, 2019 general population study found that, but it's been replicated other places as well. 
Um, this is a study that I did with uh, Maggie, Maggie Alegria and Ron Kessler. We found the black, again, general population here um, of the entire country, individ, black individuals with a, high school, uh, with a high school education are twice as likely to have a persistent substance use disorder, disorder than their comparable, care, comparably educated white counterparts. This is a study when you're looking for is there a, to specify groups, is it in black individuals in particular? Is it a subpopulation within that is suffering longer trajectories? And that's, this is some of the, one of the markers that they found. Um, you know, and again, it's anybody's speculation as to why. Are they going, are they having a, is, is it really about education? Is education just a correlate of something else? Are they having different experiences in their school? Um, there is a lot of findings about what goes on in schools and differences in race um, that could be uh, making it a different experience for them and their exposure. The cascade of care study was very powerful, and I probably, I don't think I'm ahead of myself by saying that it could be considered a landmark study in its framework that it laid out. People have been using it to understand touch points along the continuum of care, but um, this, they analyzed Medicaid, uh, Medicaid claims in the state of Florida, but one of the things they found that would be relevant to this talk today, um, two things that black patients were definitely less likely to receive medication for opioid use disorder. Um, that's considered a frontline life-saving treatment, and that's why that matters. They also found that it was more likely to be a secondary diagnosis for African Americans compared to everybody else. They're putting those things together and saying, maybe this is something you can look for in your own back door. Is maybe this is facilitating that. Well, maybe that's one of those mechanisms that's creating a health disparity, that it's not a primary diagnosis. Therefore, no access to medication is what they were National study that came out in JAMA Psychiatry, black patients 75% less likely to receive buprenorphine prescription at their visit compared to white patients. This was a geographical study out of New York that really looked at geographical access um, and who it was around. They really concluded that we have a two-tiered system that tends to be set up with buprenorphine, which is the office-based um, um, prescription tends to be accessed more by individuals who identify as white and have higher incomes, while methadone appeared to be what was more available for people of color and low income. And despite the fact that both of these are what we consider life-saving medications, they have very different effects on quality of life. Uh, for methadone, you have to drive, um, usually you have to drive to the clinic every day. The average drive in this country is 40 minutes. Um, however, buprenorphine you can take within your own, within your own house. So, quality of life implications are, are, very, are very real for them. When it comes to youth, um, there was one national study here um, that took a look at access to medications for opioid use disorder, and they did find that kind of racial disparity that tends to be reemerging in the literature that given that black youth um, and Hispanic youth um, were less likely to receive medication for opioid use disorder than white youth who had a diagnosis of opioid use disorder. So they were getting at a rate of 23% compared to 14.8 and 20%. When it comes to accessing alcohol use disorder treatment, we've had some changes with this over the last Oh, 15 years or so, there was a point where they were not accessing, the concern was they were not equally accessing care, and then of course the concern was were they accessing evidence-based care uh, in terms of professional treatment. The data, there's been a number of national studies that have come out that are now telling us that individuals that identify as black are accessing treatment for alcohol use disorder at comparable rates, in addition to which it is evidence-based. So there's our, so um, those are changes that we've seen over time. So as you can see, primary substance matters in terms of trying to identify what's going on with who and pin down trajectories. As we move on to more of the full sustained remission, this is what we call NISARC data. It is also nationally representative. Um, black, they found that black individuals were less likely to remit from substance use disorder compared to white individuals. Now in this case, they found one mechanism that closed that disparity, and it was marriage which they interpreted as a form of social support. And when they added that to model, the model then closed. Um, so I'll tell you that doesn't matter. It's still a health disparity, and it's, it, we're not gonna encourage people to get married to remit from it. You know what I'm saying? It's not a, it's not a mechanism that we're gonna tackle. So, um, 
from the Recovery Research Institute, my colleagues did this in the National Recovery Study and um, asked them, uh, when asking them about how many serious attempts did it take you to resolve your problem with alcohol or other drugs, um, it was the same for everybody. One exception, um, African Americans um, reported three serious attempts um, just, um, and others uh, made two. And uh, Dawson 2005 found this on the um, NIAAA, NIH website, black individuals um, were more likely to have a recurrent alcohol use disorder compared to other groups. So, you know, that's after you hit that full sustained remission and then you have um, a relapse after that. So you can see the, the rates between the groups were um, significantly different there. So part of what we're noticing here is a delayed onset, but yet a more chronic course of illness seems to be part of the way we can describe trajectories. Um, alcohol use disorder, they seem to have comparable access. Opioid use disorder appears to be fraught with racial differences and racial disparities. Um, you will still see some differences in alcohol use disorder that are more geographically located. Um, people kind of checking in their own back door and seeing what's going on there. But nationally, um, that is the trend right now, for sure. Um, why does this all matter? So I decided not to inundate you with graphs from the Center for Disease Control, but um, I'll just tell you one here, you know, again, why does this all matter? What's going on right, right now and what happened during the pandemic? Well, um, right now we know that there had been some changes in that black overdose mortality rates overtook that of white individuals in 2020 for the first time since 1999. And currently, American Indians and Alaska Natives are experiencing the highest rate, which is 31% higher um, than white individuals. So what does this, what does this tell us? Well, um, you know, this is, uh, it tells us that things got worse during COVID um, regarding the overdose crisis. It comes as no surprise when you think about what drives drug use or drug use disorders, isolation, fear, trauma, despair, lack of economic opportunity. Um, you know, um, in addition, the global lockdown made it harder for people to access um, recovery support services, treatment, harm reduction. So um, we have to think about you know, who this pandemic has really taken a toll on in this case. And the questions that I often get, so what do we do about it? <laughs> what do we do about it? So in this case, I'm going to review what I call um, a structural competency, both in the clinic, um, the community, um, as well as policy, um, that I think would be helpful for recovery transformations, um, in part for everybody, including black, black communities. So, Social determinants of health, um, you know, social and historical determinants like housing, they account for at least 50% of health outcomes while traditional medical care accounts for the remainder. And providers are increasingly aware of this fact, um, but yet they can express a lack of confidence in their ability to address these determinants. Um, as a result, they may avoid screening for them. Um, they may feel unequipped um, to address them. Uh, additionally, providers uh, may assume that um, it's the responsibility of their colleagues, perhaps, um, and that in case management, um, social work, or peer support, um, which is true to an extent, um, it is true to an extent, but it can be problematic um, because it reduces the social determinants to, you know, a set of problems that really lie outside of the traditional domain of um, of healthcare providers, um, but. Number one, it is important providers should address um, social determinants of health, and social determinants um, of recovery. You know, as it says here, the patients, patients are burdened by social and structural determinants and they're unable to meaningfully engage in, in traditional medical visits. You know, for example, um, doctors talk about you, they may have a patient, perhaps they would like to, there's something they need to go through, maybe they need to titrate them, but they feel like their life circumstances really won't allow for such a process. But um, providers can see these patients for many years, but really feel disempowered by the lack of progress um, over time. Uh, maybe patients eventually stop showing up and kind of feeling that your priorities and their priorities are are so different, maybe you start, they start to feel like there's no point in continuing care, but um, it's difficult for patients to meaningfully engage in some of these traditional medical visits. One of the things that can help address these things is going to be something that is the power of medical documentation. Uh, and this is something that can actually be used to address social 
determinants of recovery. You can use medical documentation to um, document eligibility for disabled housing, avoid eviction for housing or appeal denial, advocate for reasonable accommodations, avoid utility shutoff, um, obtain or retain benefits, get approval for SSI, pursue community-based alternatives to incarceration, or waive or reduce court debt, um, get disability, bus passes in, in subways. In fact, um, this is where an incredible, a colleague of mine introduced me to something that they do um, called Docs for Health. Um, it's where this comes in. This is um, a resource in Rhode Island. It was created by a multidisciplinary team, meaning lawyers, doctors. It contains high impact, provider-tested resources to address structural determinants of health. So this resource employs a rights-based approach that makes visible the ways patients experience structural violence and how providers can work alongside of them to navigate these barriers. It improves health outcomes and quality of life by capitaling on the power of medical documentation. So it was founded under the understanding that many adjunctive support services are bureaucratic, um, and paperwork is used as a barrier and justification for denial of services. Um, but providers can play an integrate role to get these services they need by documenting medical eligibility um, for many of these services. So um, here's just one example. So if you were uh, concerned with reasonable, you know, uh, poor housing conditions. So for patients who live in subsidized housing, housing. Items in the home aren't working properly. Maybe the landlord hasn't been responsive, but the patients are actually entitled to housing protections under federal legislation. So when you click on the poor housing condition, you will also see a study in JAMA that found physician-provided letters explaining fixing the housing issue from a health standpoint. Landlords addressed the issue 89% of the time when they received a letter from a physician. For example, a broken light building is causing anxiety or mold is causing asthma exasperations. A leaky tub is causing an unsafe living environment. The forms use standardized language that's required by the federal government. So you give the patient two copies, one for the landlord and one for the housing authority because legally they have 30 days to respond if the landlord doesn't. This is a powerful piece of advocacy that lies at the hands of providers. This is just one example of how um, providers can start using the power of their medical documentation. Because it was designed in Rhode Island for people in other states, you need to, for example, find out who your, ele your major electric provider is, and you have to change that and update that. Um, court finds is another example. Just, uh, just picked one from the website. Um, why does it matter? Well, court debt can negatively impact patients' ability to pay their utilities. It's a problem. In some cases, date doctors can find their patients can't maybe refrigerate their, isolin, their insulin or stress can be exasperating an underlying health condition. You know, in Rhode Island, they were getting some incredible, my, the colleagues that they're doing this have getting, gotten some incredible feedback. They're telling them these states are paying more money to enforce the fines than they're even generating in revenues. Judges are looking for reasons to reduce fines, to process people and get them through the system, but they can't make up medical reasons on their own. So um, that's one clinic-based structural competency that I would pass on to you um, to investigate community-based structural competencies um, as well. Um, I think about recovery support services that have um, a, a very important role in the community. Why? Because when we're thinking about African American communities, you have to go into their communities. You're going to have to go leave the hospital where I work. You have to go into where they play, where they eat, where they work, where they socialize. So another reason is because you are dealing with a population that has justifiably high levels of medical mistrust. Okay, um, we can talk about the forced sterilization of black women in the 40s. Um, we can talk about the Tuskegee syphilis trials where hundreds of illiterate black men were left exposed to syphilis so doctors could see how untreated course of illness played out. I still remember watching Bill Clinton apologizing to them for that scientific abuse. Um, there are entire books written on it. And so, Leveraging peers 
as the, as a, as the face of a service, can help uh, address high levels of medical mistrust, which are attached to doctors, nurses, therapists, peers, um, can help penetrate communities that high, have high levels um, of medical mistrust. For um, an example to give you about a community-based structural competency, I thought I would dive into just a few details regarding um, a finding from uh, the Soberholm uh, literature. You know, um, the question, can a doctor give an evidence-based referral to a sober home? The answer is yes. Um, we still have some work that could be done on that and breaking it more so down by primary substance, and we need trials of it um, against other frontline medications. But I want to show you this trial here. Opioid use disorder, 68% African American in this trial. You're looking at a three-arm trial in 2012, randomized controlled trial, usual care, um, meaning following um, medical detoxification. So we kind of have that incredible baseline as a scientist that we like to see but rarely can ever get. Um, usual care, meaning you give them a list of uh, uh, resources in the community. They determine where they'll go. They determine their own pathway to recovery following uh, medical detoxification. The second arm of the trial was recovery housing. It was abstinent contingent. In this case, they had to have negative drug screens for opioids and cocaine on a weekly basis. If they failed, there was failed. The test came back positive. There is a way to navigate back in, but um, so it's abstinent contingent housing. And then they added on. 12 weeks of treatment to the housing. What they found is for the usual care condition following detoxification for individuals with opioid use disorder, um, at six months, 13% were abstinent. Housing alone, 30% were abstinent. And when they added the reinforcement-based treatment, 50% um, were abstinent. Yes, a doctor can give an evidence-based referral to a recovery house for an individual with opioid use disorder, according to what we're seeing in this study. And then in 2017, more of a quasi-experimental design, they wanted to isolate the effects um, of treatment in this case. Um, but what happened when they went to analyze the data is they found no differences. And it was because so many people who were assigned to treatment only actually went and got recovery housing uh, through their own self-pay out in the community, which that messes up your design. So um, at second pass, when they analyzed the data and they looked at everybody who actually got recovery housing, whether it be through the study or self-pay, compared to people who actually did not, they did find that abstinence was four times as likely when, amongst people who were accessing the recovery housing. Um, and so that's an, um, that's an important study, uh, I think, that we've learned that um, now the la one of the last things I will touch upon here is going to be what I call policy-based um, structural competencies. Um, if you look at some of this, it's, again, this kind of ripped from the headlines here. Alcohol exclusion policies refer to a set of practices adopted by many states that allow insurance companies to deny payment for services if the injuries were related to alcohol or unprescribed drug use, um, you know, it changes over the years. I'm not sure how many are doing it now. At last count, I knew that 36 states were allowing alcohol exclusion um, policies. Um, this is incredibly devastating at breaking up the continuum of care. When somebody shows up into the emergency department, you have a touch point, might be their only touch point, at which to get them a warm handoff and a place that, that could change their trajectory. But when a doctor cannot, um, is scared to test, to provide a drug test that would allow for that because they're not even getting reimbursed for that, that coverage. It breaks up the continuum of care. Um, drug convictions can send financial aid up in smoke. This was one of the only criminal convictions that had the potential to impact um, student financial aid. Um, you could have committed uh, murder <laughs> or robbery or embezzlement and still retain your eligibility for financial aid and that is why I call that discrimination. More states lift uh, welfare restrictions. This was a federal ban um, that pro prohibited nutritional assistance um, to those who, um, for their life, um, for those who had been convicted of a felony drug crime. Um, but again, because it wasn't applying to other crimes, the logic behind it was flimsy, and as a result, I'm labeling it um, a dis an act of discrimination. Um, it inspired um, a line of questioning that I put into the National Recovery Study when we did that at the Recovery Research Institute. Um, in this case, thinking about those policies and thinking about um, 
the way they, people could still be affected by them even when they're in recovery or after they resolved a problem with alcohol or drugs. Um, I, um, I asked them, since resolving your problem, um, how frequently had the following occurred because somebody knew about your alcohol or drug history? And um, uh, there was a focus on kind of what I call macro level discriminations, violations that occur more at the structural level, organizational level, may have, may have occurred due to policy. And part of what we found here is that 15% um, of people who have um, resolved a problem with alcohol or dr other drugs in this country say that it was hard, it's hard to get health insurance because somebody knew about their alcohol um, or drug um, history. 11% saying they left a recovery or addiction treatment environment due to unfair treatment because somebody knew about their alcohol or drug history, which of course is surprising. You would think that would be a destigmatizing place, but there is certainly a body of literature um, that shows how our healthcare providers are susceptible um, to stigma and bias in their, in their roles. 13% saying that they lost their job. 11% um, say I was denied a loan or didn't even bother to apply. I put in there not even bother to apply because some people are well aware they have lost their eligibility to financial aid for the rest of their life. 9.5% saying they are denied housing because somebody knows about their history and same with uh, food assistance. Being denied the right to vote, 70.8% of individuals in this study in recovery are still being affected by this. You, um, it's not just a drug crime that can lose your right to vote. There's a number of situations that, that, that so that's a little different. 15% saying I could not get a job, 10% saying I had a job but I could not get a promotion, 16% report they felt like they were treated unfairly by the police because they knew about their history, 13% um, saying they received inadequate medical treatment because they knew about their alcohol, you know, this was a policy, we know that these, um, I could not get insurance because it would not cover some of my medical costs, you know, 10% um, say that that was happening. Now, individuals who experienced this, um, recovery-related discrimination, it was associated with more psychological distress, lower quality of life, and um, lower recovery capital. So it does matter. It does matter. And kind of in the question of the day, um, in a follow-up analysis that I did, um, it was specifically for the Research Society on Alcoholism. So at this point, I'm going to show you something that was for about 51% of the sample was in recovery from alcohol. and. Um, so this isn't good happening to anybody, and is there any racial or ethnic differences in what's happening and what's happening here? Um, it was the same for everybody, but there was one group. There was one group. We find that if you are um, identified as black um, in rec and had resolved a problem with, with alcohol, um, they were three times as likely to say that they left a recovery or addiction treatment environment because somebody knew about their history, twice as likely to report that they lost their job because somebody knows about their history, three times as likely to report being denied housing, three times as likely to report I could not get a job because somebody knew about my history, and four times as likely to report I had a job but I could not get a promotion. Um, and so notice those employment effects as well, employment and housing effects that are showing through. You know, these structural, these types of um, structural effects are the things that we should be considering as mechanisms of health disparities. A lot of our literature focuses on um, individual level, um, interpersonal and individual interactions as um, perhaps mechanisms of disparities, but despite increasing national recognition that it's really the structural components, it's the things that it's baked into sometimes um, that are really kind of um, driving these macro level structural disparities. In conclusion to some of the things that we've learned today, uh, I talked about racial literacy um, and that race is, was derived as a social construct. Um, it should be interpreted through the lens of a caste system. Um, in course of, terms of course of illness um, and recovery, individuals who identify as black appear to have a more chronic course of illness despite delayed onset and um, often equivalent prevalence. Um, right now, we're not seeing equivalent access to various medications for uh, opioid use disorder. We need to be asking all those questions about recovery support services, too. We just don't have, haven't gotten that far. I, I'll get there. I'll get there. Um, and then um, just reviewed some what I call structural competencies that can be um, leveraged in terms of working in the policy realm, uh, the clinic or the 
uh, or the community, but these are, these are kind of the levers that we can pull to really reshape the landscape of recovery. And um, you know, we need to change the narrative to focus on what our institutions are doing to magnify harm as opposed to minimize harm uh, and promote recovery. By the year uh, 2060, there'll be no single racial or ethnic majority in this country. So it is critical for community members, scientists, doctors to anticipate increasing diversity and make these considerations and build them into what you are doing. Thank you.